So next up we have Dr. Kim Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones completed her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. She is currently an associate professor and the undergraduate associate chair for the Department of Chemical Engineering. And her main research interest lies in the tish in tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, and immune and inflammatory responses to biomaterials. And I will let her take the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we heard a lot about uh, different ways of, that you could create an artificial kidney, but it's, you've been very patient sitting here for almost an hour, so I'm going to get a little bit of audience involvement. So what do you think could possibly go wrong with an implanted artificial kidney? It stops working. Why would it, yeah, so it could stop working. Why could it stop working? What, were the, what are the, some of the reasons it might stop working? What do you think? So Morteza touched on one. Yep. Um, the filters can get clogged. So the filters can get clogged. That's absolutely true. What clogs them? Yeah. Yeah, so the blood can clot on them. That's one of the big initial things. So blood clots are probably the most difficult challenge to overcome when you're doing a situation like this where the idea is to run blood basically past a filter all the time. Um, so blood clots are a big one. There are a number of others. Um, usually anyone who's in hemodialysis or um, having their blood contacting any kind of biomaterial for an extensive period of time is on long-term anticoagulants or blood thinners. So those come with their own risks because you don't want lots of clots to form and we're not good at making biomaterials yet that don't clot lots of blood. Um, other side effects uh, is that you can lose some of your neutrophils, you can lose some of your platelets. These are actually risks that current hemodialysis patients have. Uh, so when your blood is contacting the biomaterial so much, um, components of your blood break down, uh, which is a problem. Uh, oh, I put that two times by mistake. Obviously, I was thinking about it twice. Um, and you can also have acute inflammation around the in implant that is potentially risky. Uh, the, it could integrate or heal poorly, uh, particularly where it's connected to the blood system. Um, if it's actually an indwelling uh, implanted system, you want it to be stable and not like shaking around and falling off the blood vessels so that blood is pouring into your peritoneum or wherever you've implanted that. That would be a problem, right? Um, fibrosis around the implant, again, that goes along with uh, integration and healing. You don't want a lot of scar tissue to build up around the implant. In particular, you don't want it to build up where it's connected to the blood vessels because that could actually pinch off the blood flow. Um, which would be problematic. And something we don't talk about a lot, um, and I'm not going to actually talk about for the rest of the presentation, but is imp an important consideration um, always is infection. Uh, so particularly if you have something where you have a port and it has to be outside, uh, a port is a big source that you can have biobacterial based infections introduced. Um, which can be very difficult to treat with antibiotics. And even, even inside, uh, potentially, you could have some issues. So think about the issues of blood clotting and the filter stopping working, I think, are the two big things that we really have to be concerned about. Um, so why does blood clot? Why do we have these issues when we have a biomaterial uh, contacting blood or contacting any fluid within your body? Well, the first thing that happens is that the proteins, so you have this lovely, sterile, clean biomaterial that you put in contact with blood or even peritoneal fluid anywhere in the body. The first thing that happens almost immediately is that the many proteins that are around uh, come and they interact with the biomaterial and they adsorb to the surface. So they actually, some, it depends on the characteristics of the surface, but they'll actually often rearrange and they have an almost permanent adsorption to the surface. So what the body ends up seeing isn't actually usually the biomaterial itself, it's the proteins that stick to the surface almost right away. Um, so this can have a number of effects. One is that the proteins that are on the surface affect the downstream effects, 
So, you know, how will the body respond subsequently may not depend on the polymer itself. It might depend on which, poly or which proteins it's actually seeing that are adsorbed to the polymer. Um, and the other thing that can happen is these proteins can actually uh, break down and initiate different cascades. So one of the cascades that they can initiate is the coagulation cascade. Uh, so one of the things that will adsorb to biomaterial surfaces is fibrinogen. And fibrinogen will actually then activate the blood coagulation ca cascade, catalyzing prothrombin to become thrombin. And eventually you end up with uh, fibrin, for, or thro fibrin formation, so a, a provisional matrix. Uh, the surface also activates platelets. And the platelets interact with this fibrin matrix and start to form a thrombus. So that's your blood clot. And the blood clot might stay on the surface or the blood clot might break free and um, have you, make you have a stroke or something other that would be really bad. So generally blood clots, not good. In particular, you can imagine if this is your filter surface, your filter isn't going to work for very long if this is covering the entire surface. It'll actually uh, stop flow into the filter pores, right? So that would be bad on a number of levels. Um, how do people, you know, people have had biomaterials in the body for a long time. Even you hear about people who have had biomaterial uh, polyurethane blood vessels. Those still actually clot. The only place that you can have biomaterial blood vessels function in the body is where they're relatively large diameter. So the, and have a high blood flow past them. So lots of shear past the surface so that the no large clots have time to build up. So those, those blood vessels actually do have clots covering the entire surface, but they're big enough that the clots don't plug them up. And the flow is fast enough that no big clots build up and then break off. You just have little, you probably have some tiny little clots breaking off from them, but not big ones. So when we start talking about nanopores, these are things that won't necessarily work well with blood. So I'd say this is, and Morteza would agree, this is probably the biggest limitation and the biggest difficulty when we're talking about how do we have an implanted uh, and effective filter. Um, and I'm gonna ask you later, how do you regenerate or uh, replace the filters? I think that'll be a really interesting question. Um, and other things happen with that protein adhesion, or adsorption rather, to the surface, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So uh, one of the proteins that can adsorb is complement. Other proteins that can adsorb are um, immunoglobins. Uh, so the complement cascade can be initiated by the protein adsorption. Uh, uh, proteins that actually cells will specifically recognize as targeting molecules can adsorb to the uh, surface as well. Okay, so I mean, in my <laughs> so you'll see that uh, this is this is research that I'm interested in. Uh, so I'm also interested in what happens downstream of blood clotting. Um, Mortez and I were actually talking about. Uh, what's happened in the field and what's sort of interesting in the field of blood material, uh, biomaterial host responses. And uh, 20 years ago, there was a huge amount of research in blood material interactions. Uh, actually, at McMaster, we had Dr. John Brash, who was one of the pioneers in the field of blood material interactions, um, really one of the first people who started looking at it. Uh, he's emeritus now uh, and did some amazing work. And it was really big. And now you hardly see anyone. And I think the reason that you hardly see anyone is because it's a very difficult problem to solve. And all the grad students who tried to solve it went in with great enthusiasm and went out deciding that they didn't want to waste their career on something they couldn't solve. Um, so there's very little work actually done anymore on blood material interactions, although it's a very important problem that isn't yet solved. Um, so I think there's actually a lot of possibilities still to come on understanding and overcoming blood material interactions. And some of that work will be really helpful 
when we start to think about miniatri miniaturized devices that can function uh, inside a body. Um, and I think that's an important aspect. But what happens after uh, you get the sort of initial, there's the bare biomaterial surface, you get the protein adsorption happening, then uh, because there's been damage, because something's been implanted, neutrophils will come and they'll interact with the surface, they'll release chemokines that then attract monocytes, the monocytes turn into macrophages, the macrophages interact with the surface. Um, they, what do macrophages like to do? They like to eat things, so they try and phagocytose the surface. Um, but macrophages are used to phagocytosing really small things, and when they come to a really large surface, they actually undergo something called frustrated phagocytosis. They get really angry at the surface. Um, so sometimes they'll release uh, their um, content, so uh, reactive oxygen products in particular, um, but often they'll ultimately merge and turn into foreign body giant cells that cover the entire surface. They'll release a lot of cytokines into the environment. Um, these cells, both of those cell types, can actually, over time, break down the surface uh, because they release so much reactive oxygen. Uh, so that's a problem, especially if you have polymers. Uh, polymers react with reactive oxygen, and they'll break down over a period of time. Um, ultimately, uh, the macrophages will release cytokines that actually will cause fibroblasts uh, potentially to turn into myofibroblasts, lay down a lot of extracellular matrix, scar tissue, and the body tries to wall it off. So in a really bad circumstance, not only do you have blood clotting, but you have scarring happening all over uh, a membrane device. And a scar obviously is going to interfere with the function of a membrane. So that would be worst case scenario. I think we're still very much at the solving the first problem, um, but I'm also interested in my research in trying to solve this long-term downstream problem, which will also influence how well it sticks in there. Um, so just a little bit more about that. I'm not going to get into it in detail, uh, I just because I find it interesting. Um, macrophages aren't just in one flavor. They come in phenotypes. Uh, so it's not just whether you have the macrophages there, it's what they do. Uh, so they can either be pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic, fibrolytic maybe. They have a bunch of different flavors that potentially influence what happens downstream. Um, and then myofibroblasts themselves can, might be influenced by the macrophage phenotype um, but it can also come from a number of different cell types, fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, fibrocytes. There are a number of different places that those cells can come from. And ultimately, like if you think, if you've ever seen, hopefully you've never done this search, but uh, pictures, I, I actually did the search and decided not to use the picture um, of breast implants that have failed. Uh, they get really hard and pull really tightly, that's because myofibroblasts have formed a huge hard scar tissue and are trying to pull it tight. Um, so I'm never going to get a breast implant. <laughs> but but uh, it's, that would also be a non-ideal, ultimate long-term issue with this sort of thing. Um, so first problem, biggest problem, blood clotting. Other problems are sort of, would be nice to solve downstream, but probably patients could live with them for a long time. And there are other cells that might be involved. Lymphocytes certainly are involved. They have pattern recognition receptors on them as well that can recognize uh, proteins and biomaterials. Mast cells probably have some involvement. It's complicated, and people don't actually understand it really well, what happens in these uh, interactions. So what materials should Martes have been using? He certainly discovered that silicon uh, mechanically probably wasn't the best one. Um, but there might be some better materials that he can use. Um, certainly 
really, really hydrophobic materials are bad. So that first slide I showed with the protein adsorption, if you have a really hydrophobic material, the hydrophobic cores of proteins will actually rearrange to stick to that hydrophobic material and the proteins will become incredibly denatured. So those typically are the worst materials, those incredibly hydrophobic materials. Really cationic materials, very positively charged materials, um, can actually kill negatively charged cells. So you don't want a really cationic material either. It can actually be toxic, which is the worst possible thing. You're killing all your cells. Um, there's a lot of interesting work with hydrogels. They're promising as far as checking a lot, a lot of the boxes as far as um, interacting with the cell types, but they're mechanically weak. Um, we showed, actually both Peter and Merteza showed the decellularized kidneys. Um, those are often regenerative. Uh, so the actual response, the body's response to them is regenerative, but they also will clot blood. Um, so collagen clots blood and what's left in the ECM, if you don't do anything else, like cover it with cells, will clot blood. Um, so most biomaterials ultimately do cause clotting and fibrosis. Um, so how do the cells identify a foreign biomaterial? There are danger associated molecular patterns, um, patterns from the polymer itself, um, adsorbed opsonins, so these are like the IgGs and complement that interact with macrophages. Uh, the material properties themselves, so really stiff materials will increase fibrosis. The shape and porosity of the material are important. Um, if you're designing how blood flows through it, you don't want any sharp corners that the blood has to turn around causing turbulence. Um, and then ongoing micro damage. So all of these things are ways that the cells potentially are interacting with the material and uh, certainly the protein adsorption is, is important in the blood clotting. So what can we do? Oh, so you can have change physical properties of the material, you can change the surface chemistry, <coughs> you could do controlled release or cell therapy. So I'll briefly go into each of them. Um, so <coughs> physical properties, now we're talking about things like stiffness, porosity, um, whether it looks like and it sort of biomimics the body's own material. Um, so if you have a smooth material, it'll actually cause more fibrosis. Um, but if you have lots of surface area, then that's more places for blood to clot. Uh, physical properties were the place that people started looking 20 years ago. Uh, people are actually starting to look at it again. Uh, uh, when we start looking at fibrosis, I think it's maybe a little bit less important for blood clotting. Um, chemistry, so this is actually the, the one example that Morteza gave from what he did in his PhD, um, trying to stop proteins from adsorbing to the surface at all was one of the first things people tried. So using polyethylene oxide or polyethylene glycol, it's a linear, very hydrophilic polymer that acts sort of like a comb to interact with water instead of proteins and it keeps proteins from sticking to the surface, but it doesn't last forever and it's not perfect. So it mostly works, kind of, but it'll still clot proteins or clot blood eventually. Um, and then if left in over long periods of time, it's still problematic. Uh, people have tried actually doing surface modifications. Uh, so putting specific things on the surface to interact with, say, specific cells. Um, I won't talk about the last one because it's not relevant to this talk. Um, controlled release is an interesting one. Uh, so pe people have actually bo both done uh, chemical modification of the surface. So one of the ways that people have tried to do it is actually put anticoagulants on the surface. So put heparin on the surface. Again, it works pretty well. Uh, Dr. Brash had a cool thing where he actually mixed some uh, things that broke up clots in with his polymer and they migrated to the surface. So that was kind of cool. Um, if you're interested in inflammation, you could put dexamethasone or IL-10 as release agents. Uh, another thing you can do is actually uh, transfect local, so release agent DNA that will transfect local cells to do things that you want to do. Probably not as relevant in a uh, flow past blood kind of situation, but maybe interesting for what's around it. Um, and then the other thing is to somehow incorporate cells into your therapy system. 
So either try and stick cells to your surface, have cells maybe do some of your filtration, try and do a partially tissue engineering approach. Um, maybe the cells themselves are genetically engineered to release uh, anticoagulant factors. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can approach the problem. Um, but it is a big problem. I still think that there is hope for a successful artificial kidney. Uh, we just have to understand really where the limiting factors lie and what are the key roadblocks that we have to overcome and work with the biology, not against the biology. So I think at this point, thank you for your attention and I think we'll all take questions. <laughs>